Starting in verse 1 in chapter 11 of Mark, I want to read just down through 11, chapter, uh, verse 11, and then we'll get into the message. The triumphal entry is the heading there, and it says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus set two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve Thank you, God, for your word. I could probably spend all morning on verse 11, but I'm not even going to really get to that because just the simple fact, and this I've just noticed in reading it, as he entered Jerusalem, he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Jump into the very beginning of John's gospel and you'll understand. He took lay of the ground. And then he went and went to sleep. Because the next morning, for all intents and purposes in that temple, all hell broke loose. But that'll be for next week. So, what I want us to take a look at today is a different kind of power. A different kind of power. And that the kingdom of God, that God has established here in this world, that he has established through Jesus, operates with a different kind of power. His coronation had an entirely different purpose than all of the other kings and queens that this world has ever seen. And his reign actually started not at what we would consider the beginning of somebody's life, but it started when he died, as odd as that seems. And just an observation to set the ground for us this morning. I really want us to take a look at a couple things. One is the endless global cycle of political grandstanding in elections that seem to go from moment to moment to me are one of the most unhelpful and irritating things that humankind has ever invented and put on TV. Every day, another talking head for their moment in time tries to capture their five minutes of fame with some snarky, empty comment some belittling of another politician who's been put in power or a system or a plan that we have put out to try and fix the problems we have. Instead of just quietly going about their day and going about the business of doing what it is they've been elected to, they look for the limelight. They want to be five minutes in front of that camera eye, put right on the center stage, trying to sell what it is they want to sell. Now, the only difference that we deal with in 21st century world and 21st century America here in humanity is that what happens in the farthest reaches of outer Siberia can be in my living room within a two-minute time span or however long it takes for that news loop to get and dump it into my lap. History is full of human beings, men and women, who feel the need to coerce, to berate, to cajole and by any other means necessary seize power and control the narrative in this world. It's one of the reasons why history, as bizarre as this is going to sound, is one of my favorite topics. At the same time, it frustrates me. And I understand that that's weird, but I love to study how kings and queens and nations and kingdoms all come to be and how it is they end up collapsing eventually at some point. How they grew over time, some over thousands of years, and then it seems like when the day they're gone. And looking at the why of all of that. Places like Egypt, Babylon, the Media Persian Empire, Greece, Rome. We can look even closer to the Great Britain in our own time even, in the United States of America, and all kinds of other places that could be listed. And being that many of these have taken over time, or at times, they've been taken over by brute force with armies so large that you could barely count, nobody could even stand in their way. Only if you study that in the course of history, some bigger dog on the playground always shows up. Some other bully always shows up, 
having the same thing happen to them, they are then destroyed and another kingdom moves in. Now Rome, having conquered the entire known world at the time of Jesus here, ultimately crumbled from within. I mean, somebody took them over at the end of all things, but they ultimately crumbled from within. Moral decay, the loss of good leadership or many good leaders, Caesars who thought themselves divine, allowed the entire kingdom to collapse in on itself because they weren't making good decisions. History shows, if you study Rome, a very slow and painful death of societal and moral corruption and decay and collapse that left people vulnerable that they were supposed to take care of. But it also left the entire structure of their society weak and ripe and ready to be overtaken. It's no wonder that great city was sacked in a day, as the saying goes, it wasn't built in a day, but it was taken over in a day. Because as I said, there's always that bully on the playground. There's always that one general that is just bigger and better and more powerful than anyone else around. It's always the way this world has operated. Brute force, extra power, intimidation, sheer strength to dominate, to rule, and to maintain that rule by all means necessary. Now that I've encouraged you this Palm Sunday morning, we want to ask ourselves, what on earth does that have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, what I want to say to you is that every single thing about the story of the Bible and of this Jesus of Nazareth speaks of a different way of being and a different way of doing kingdom work. It speaks of a different kind of power, one that this world does not like and really doesn't understand. This little Jewish carpenter named Jesus of Nazareth, an actual person who lived some 2,000 years ago, showed up on the scene under suspect circumstances and questionable parentage. Not a way you'd want to start a story for somebody who you're going to push and promote as the Messiah, but there you have it because it's true. And here we are some 2,000 years on that we said this over and over again in these last weeks. We still talk about this man. We still talk about this little carpenter. History is dated, in fact, by his birth. And billions of people on this planet call themselves followers of Jesus. He never owned a home. His ministry, he never traveled more than 100 miles away from where he was born. And yet the Bible tells us that this little Jewish carpenter healed blind people. He rose people from the dead. He fed thousands upon thousands of people on the hillsides throughout Judea when they were hungry. People came from all over to hear him speak, just to get close enough to him to touch the hem of his garment. He had no weapons of warfare that he used except the words that came out of his mouth. He had no army that followed him, and yet he challenged the powers that be in the most subversive way possible. He simply loved people and even more bizarre he loved his enemies even when they sought to destroy him over and over again and he challenged all of the leaders and all of the rulers at the time that he was here by telling them all that they were doing and all that they were saying and how they were doing it wrong that there is a better way to do these things see to get a good understanding of this to understand that there's a right way to govern and rule, to understand that there's a right way to treat people, and to understand that there's actually a right way to be human, we gotta go all the way back to the beginning for a couple of minutes and understand the story of Adam and Eve and how they went very sideways very quickly. And that led to a man by the name of Abraham, that man of faith whom God called and sent out into this world and said, you go there and then I'll tell you what it is you're to do. And then to Moses, that great deliverer, where he pulled his people out of Egypt, where he had placed them to save them from starvation. But they ended up in slavery after 400 years, and they were being mistreated. He led them out in that great exodus, where the Red Sea was parted, and they stepped into a brand new reality of freedom as people who were called by God to live in this world in a particular way for a particular, for a particular purpose in order that the world may know what it means to follow this God of Israel. That ultimately led to a kingdom whose king was David, whose king was David, a man who was after God's own heart. 
He had set himself up, or he was a broken man, actually, as setting himself up because God had anointed him and called him, and one who was actually in God's heart and who was called by him to rule and lead in a way that was contrary to the world. You will be my king for my purposes, and you will lead in my way. David's story, if you spend time in that in the Old Testament and that of the prophets who would come after him, pointed forward always pointed forward to this one true king who the Old Testament always talked about, who would come and rule this world as it should have always been ruled when Adam and Eve were actually put in the garden. But because they went the wrong way, it needed to be fixed. So why does any of that history have to do with Palm Sunday, you ask? A lot, actually, because this Jesus of Nazareth wasn't just A carpenter. He wasn't just a guy who was born in Bethlehem and came from Nazareth. He was the king who God had promised this entire world. And he's been and they had been waiting a thousand years for him. They wanted a king who would deliver them from the rule of this oppressive power from Rome itself. That power that they knew was keeping them in slavery in their own land. That's what they were waiting for. And as backwards as this seems, as you could get when you think of the Roman Empire at that time, they ruled the known world. And they did so very efficiently, didn't they? They were very effective with the violence and the fear and how it is they kept everybody under their thumb. It's not unfamiliar to us in this world today. They'd kill all who got in their way. Anybody who questioned how they did things, that was how they kept rule. So how would one man, how is it one man from a tiny backwater country on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire turn an entire world upside down by being the king that the world needed, not the king that the world wanted, but by being king that the world needed. You see, Jesus spent only three years in public ministry. That's all he did. He traveled with 12 hand-picked guys doing all kinds of things that pointed to what Jesus called the kingdom of God. He started his ministry in his hometown of Nazareth by reading from Isaiah the prophet. So nothing was a mystery to anybody. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Right off the bat, this is what power looks like from a heavenly perspective. Healing the broken world. Reconciling lost people to the God in heaven and reconciling people to each other, proclaiming freedom to all who are oppressed. Jesus has left us, jumping forward to us just as an aside here for a minute. He has left us to be the people of ministry with the ministry of reconciliation in this world. So what that means is that anybody that we encounter on a daily basis who doesn't know who this Jesus is, we are to see them with the eyes of Jesus. And we are to engage them with the heart of Jesus that seeks to restore, that seeks to bring them back into the kingdom and to see them as they are, image bearers of the creator of the universe. Again, that's what power looks like from the heavenly perspective. Proclaiming freedom to all who are oppressed. And you see, when he read that, all was really good until all of a sudden it wasn't because they discovered what it was Jesus was saying, and he didn't fit the bill. He didn't fit the bill. He was just that carpenter's son whose mom was Mary, whose dad they were kind of sure was Joseph, but that was always a question that they had. So it didn't make any sense to them that he would read a passage of Scripture like that that really said to them, I'm the guy you've been waiting for. But you see, this is what his ministry would look like for the next three years. People would always question him. He would go from town to town proving that he was their long-awaited king, 
but he would never let them squeeze himself and his ministry into what their mind and their idea of what a king and a kingdom ought to look like, what their desires were for a king. He would never fit into that. And that's what makes this moment, this Palm Sunday moment in Mark chapter 11, so powerful and so important for us to understand in 2021. We should understand it in this way all the time. Because right here at what the beginning of what we call Holy Week, this very meek, this very mild, this very calm, and this very humble, and yet this very powerful, obscure carpenter prepares to enter his city one last time. And the only person that is in control of all of these events that we're going to discover throughout Holy Week is the one who rides in in this way. A king coming into his city at that time would always do so on the biggest horse possible. And typically that horse was a bright white horse. So everybody who was watching the parade would understand and know that that's the guy. That's the one that you give credit for, for conquering everybody around. Leading the procession as his people hailed him and cheered him as he entered into the city. But Jesus couldn't do that. He couldn't do that. He wouldn't do that. And one of the reasons why he wouldn't, first off, is that the Romans would see this and they would call it exactly what it was. Treason. Treason. The divine Caesars had already laid claim to that title, Messiah King. And in comes this little guy on a donkey declaring the same thing. You see, the divine Augustus had brought about peace and prosperity and had been brought to the world through the Pax Romana, but that came at a cost. That came at full submission to the emperor as your divine ruler or death. That's how the powers of this world do things. But for Jesus, for Jesus, that's not how his kingdom would be declared. That's not how it would look like. And he is functioning not as a worldly king would, but as the one true king whom God has anointed It's a different kind of power that is on display here as he enters his city. And one that no one really understood at that moment in time or would be able to even understand until that next Sunday. They still couldn't get it. When the quietness of a garden, the stone was rolled away and women, yes, women, not men, but women stood amazed at what they didn't see there. And we'll unpack that next week because that is something important for us not to miss. And just as an observation as well, King David never rode a big white horse himself either. He was God's anointed. And from the very beginning of that kingdom, the kingdom of Israel never rode a horse. The king never led the procession in that way. As backwards and as weird as this may seem, The kingly ride of God's chosen people in this world was always a beast of burden. It was always a donkey. It was never a war horse. The very ride that the kings of Israel were on indicated how God desired to do things. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away, and they found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. This Sunday morning, Right at the beginning of the great Passover festival, the people of Israel would recognize what Jesus was doing and what he was saying without saying it. They would get it. Right under the noses of the Roman rulers, Jesus was going to slip into the city and the people began to cheer because they understood what was going on. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road And others spread leafy or palm branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if every one of you stood up and screamed at the top of your voice, that's what it would sound like. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. 
echoing down through the valley as Jesus came down with all of those people around him singing this towards the temple. All of their voices together shouting and declaring that Jesus, that the king, had arrived. And he had done so in the most subversive of ways. Quietly coming down the hill, but not so quiet. It would have been a beautiful sight and sound if you were there. It would have rung down through the valley. And sadly, as happens so often, the people who were doing this only really knew half of what was going on. They didn't know the whole story at this moment in time. They were thinking that he was coming to set his kingdom up right here in the here and now and kick the Romans out. We're going to be free from all of this nonsense. Israel will be free again from the oppressive worldly powers. No different than our world today. Absolutely no different. We demand so loudly and so harshly for our rights and for our desires. And once we actually get them, we wonder why we even fought for such things. We divide over those things. Or even worse, even worse, and if I had a Dr. Seuss quote, I'd put it out here, but I don't. We continue to fight violently to keep what's, what we've finally got. And then we continue to change the story and the narrative of our time to make sure everyone who doesn't think like us is kept quiet and under thumb. We're no different. We have to be very careful. Make no mistake about that. We may legislate this kind of absurdity and violence by making it look good and doing so by passing laws that ultimately kill the unborn, that put out to pasture those who are old and we don't seem to feel have any significance in this day and age. And then we turn around and we cancel everything that we don't like and think that at some point our opinion isn't going to be canceled. That is not how the kingdom works. Our current narrative will never, never hold up against what the Bible says. You see, we redefine what a human is all the while we can't even figure out what it means to be human. Jesus is defining for us not only what it means to be human, but what a king looks like when God puts him there. And standing on the hill against all of the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly places and in this world and all of those high places is Jesus And the story of this Bible here that is unchanging, it is unyielding, and it is absolutely uncompromising against the tide of all the personal feelings and the ever-changing stories in this world. It does not move. It has not moved for 2,000 years. It has stood the test of time. It will continue to stand the test of time. The story of the Bible is God's love story towards all humanity, and it stands stubbornly against everything that wants it to be quiet. And you cannot silence what this book has to say. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. That is the promise of scripture. And we can fight like hell and try and make that go away. But it doesn't. We can try and work our way towards getting rid of this book and the fact that it is God's word, unchanging, even in the midst of every crazy idea and every opinion of simply just changing and wiping it all away based upon how we feel or trying to convince anyone who will listen that this is just an old, outdated book. Listen, it isn't. It's not. It is the only thing that brings peace In a world that has completely, completely lost its story, the Bible stands declaring as loud as possible that every human being has value as they are created, not as they desire to be, but as God has created them. Every human being has value. This Jesus died for men and women. He died for boys and girls. He died for every tribe and every nation that has ever existed. He didn't hang on a tree for an idea. He didn't hang on a tree for a feeling or a concept. He died for you. He died for me. He died for every person that has ever walked this planet. Is it 64 teams that get called to the tournament? He died for 65, 66. 67, that one sheep that is on the back pasture trying to find its way home, that is a different kind of king. That is a different kind of kingdom. That is a different kind of power. A servant king who would lay down his life for those who love him and lay down his life for those who hate him. There's not a story in this world 
that has ever been told like this. You give me a better story and I'll think about considering it. But there's never been one written like this. And I fail myself and I fail everybody else as a pastor and a preacher if I didn't say to you that this world and all of its ideas and demands offer to you nothing at all. It doesn't mean we don't work in this world. It doesn't mean we don't work within the systems that we have. We have to. We live in probably the most beautiful country this world has ever seen with freedoms that we have that nobody else has. We should never take that for granted. But we also need to understand that the world fights against that and tries to offer a different story. You see, this Jewish carpenter, this Jesus, you know what he offers you? His very life. He offers you his very life that you may live in the fullness of joy in the here and now and then for all eternity. You see, this week would start with the crowds declaring him the son of David. In other words, the king. Cheering him in a way that caused great concern to those who were in power because they understood what was going on. They knew deep down that this Jesus was a great threat to them and their control. You see, as we come to a close here this morning, it had been promised by the prophets of long ago that when God returned to his kingdom, this is actually what it would look like. And Dave read for us this morning, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. See, this descent down the Mount of Olives and into this city would set the stage for the week that would change the world. A week that would change the world. For by Thursday night and then into Friday morning, they would be cheering in a different way. In an entirely different way. See, this king who rode in on a donkey would receive his crown of thorns and he would be tacked to his throne, the cross. That act, that kingdom power, as weird and as backwards as it may seem, would lead to the freeing of all humanity. Behold, your king comes to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey, showing every one of us a different kind of power and a different kind of kingdom that is not of this world, but it most certainly is for this world. Let's pray. Let's pray. And we're going to sing one last song. And I do want to remind you that if you're in need of prayer, we are doing that again. Just raise your hand where you're seated and we will get to you after everybody else is dismissed. But we don't want you leaving this place this morning if you're in need of prayer for whatever reason. Fathers, we just thank you for this word. Seal it up in our hearts. Seal it up in our hearts. Help us to see where it is we need to step into different things and different ways of thinking and being. Help us to see where we are doing the things that you have called us to in a right way. Each one of us, as I always pray, Lord, is gifted in a different way. And we are set down in different positions and places to do the things that you've called us to do. May we always stand that ground wherever you put us in a loving and compassionate way in understanding that there is a line to be held and there is a course that we must stay. And we discover here in this story that there's a cost to be paid Strengthen us, Lord, in that and encourage us that we may find great joy in that. As we close in this last song, Lord, may we sing to you. May we lift our voices to you and be thankful for what it is you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for one last song.